Liang Zhao, thanks so much for coming on to Evolution Soup from your home in Bonn, Germany. You're a science journalist and communicator, and you're currently studying biology and English at the University of Bonn. Now, you are a science journalist and radio reporter, as well as the founder of <laughs> Liang's Lab News on Instagram and Facebook, and are passionate about science and evolution, and especially getting young people excited about the sciences. So uh, how are you doing today, Liang? Uh, what's the latest you've been writing about in Liang's Lab News? Hi, Mark. I'm doing fine. How are you? Very good, thanks. What's uh, what's going on in the uh, the world of lab news? I'm running a series of portraits of endangered animals. So um, mm -hmm. each day I would introduce a new species which is critically endangered, endangered or vulnerable, um, according to the IUCN um, status. And uh, I would just talk about their, um, write about their biology and write about the species um, like, for example, hip history or um, mm -hmm. also why they are actually endangered to raise awareness for them and um, to help, um, yeah, to help save these species. <laughs> Excellent. Liang, before we learn more about what you do, can we hear just a little bit about your background? Yes, sure. Um, well, I was born in China, uh, in Tianjin to be precise, and uh, which is very near to Beijing and I grew up there until I was seven and then we moved to Germany, my mom and I, and um, we moved here because my stepdad is German and we kind of figured it's easier here. So I went to school in Germany in Hanover, which is um, a town very close by to Bonn. And um, yeah, after mm -hmm. school, I started university. I'm currently studying biology and English as a teaching degree at the University of Bonn, and I'll continue to study a Master of Science in Science Communication in UK from September on this year. Right, and I believe you've had, um, you spent some time in Ireland, as did I. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I did. I um, spent a semester there when I was abroad for Erasmus at UCC University College Cork, which was a great experience. <laughs> and so obviously your love of science was just building and building all the time. Yes, right. Right, so when did you first realize that you loved science? I think that my love for science kind of started with my love for animals. So when I was mm -hmm. uh, little and still in China, I had a lot of animals. When I was a kid, for example, I had uh, chickens and ducks and cats and dogs. And sometimes I would go out and collect some snails mm -hmm. and put them together and breed them. And my mom was just wow. <laughs> very encouraging about that because she just saw how much I loved to like watch them live and do whatever animals do. And yeah, later in school, I just love learning more about their biology and everything like that. And um, yeah, so I kept on studying it and I'm just, I'm still getting more and more fascinated about biology. And I think that's the main reason I love science, <laughs> but not only, of course, not only about animals, but about sciences in general. I also very much enjoy going to museums, for example. And um, I think that's also a very inspiring place. And you've got some really wonderful museums there in Germany, haven't you? Yes, we do. I actually work at one um, here at the Zoological Research Museum in Bonn. Um, it's called Museum mm. König, and which means king, but it's about the Alexander König, um, who was a scientist. And uh, I'm giving guided tours here through the dinosaur exhibition as well as native animals. Well, your goal has always been to be a science communicator. So can you explain how you would define science communicator? I would say that science communication is just everything what happens between science and the public. And sadly, I find that there's not much happening between these two poles. So I think science communicators are kind of a channel between um, this field of science and everybody actually, um, and also non-specialists, for, for example. And um, what we do is just we make science accessible, understandable, engaging to everyone in any kind of way. It could be, for example, through journalism, through um, articles or podcasts, or also through tours at a museum as I do them. Um, but I think also, for example, science institutes um, have uh, public relations and everything, and they also try to spread their um, findings and everything to people 
So all of this is just a big er area about um, in which, yeah, just we try to make people um, understand what's happening in science and maybe also catch their interest for it. <laughs> Yeah, I'm sure you discovered uh, that there is a lot of pseudoscience and a misunderstanding of science out there. I mean, are you concerned about, like, in America and a little bit here in England, we have, you know, this this notion of should there be teaching the controversy of evolution versus creationism in schools? I mean, is that something that comes up with you? Uh, well, I don't have too much about a creationist background. I also don't know many people who um, support that. But I think it is quite important, especially in this um, kind of discussions, to um, clarify what is actually proven in science. And um, in that sense, I um, am quite sure that uh, it is important to teach evolution. Um, of course, it is important to have some religious and cultural values too. Mm -hmm. And also, to, it's very interesting to um, think about religion and talk about it and everything. And I also support people who believe in, in it. But I think that everyone has a chance, should have at least a chance to um, understand what's actually going on and what um, <laughs> scientists and researchers have actually found out and why they are so sure about it. and. Yeah, I think it's just important to let everybody know, um, yeah, what's actually going on. <laughs> you mentioned that you worked at the Koenig Museum and you were you were a tour guide there. So you, could you tell us a little bit about that? Yes, sure. I uh, work as a tour guide for the dinosaur exhibition and for the native animals exhibition right now. And I also lead some courses, but um, that's something different. Um, so I do tours in my languages, which are Chinese, German, French and English. And um, then I would just go through the exhibition with a group of people. They might maybe a public group um, which just came to visit um, the museum and saw the guided tour and just joined. Or they could also have booked the tour. Um, so I would bring them um, and, and lead them guide them through the um, exhibition and show them the different animals and talk about um, their biology and their um, ecosystem and everything. Because our museum has a special, very special um, kind of exhibiting um, the animals. So we would, wouldn't um, put them into um, taxonomy group um, as, for example, normal natural history museums do it. Mm but we would put the animals into a scenario where they would naturally um, be so we put them into a oh. habitat for example we have a we have um antarctis or we have uh the we have africa we have australia and then we have dinosaurs but that's a special exhibition right now yeah. um but then we also have um for example rainforest so we always have these ecosystems where all the all the animals are put together um, as they would um, be together in the natural habitat. So that makes my work especially interesting because then I would go through the ecosystems and talk about all the different animals and how they also interact with each other. Uh -huh. And it's just so nice. I love my job because then I can directly talk to the people i get direct feedback and um yeah and i see how people get fascinated about um things that they haven't known about before and that's just really nice when for example when people come later to me um and tell me that they've learned something new and mm. that that sounds really interesting to them and they want to know more about it and that's actually everything i want that people get interested in science and um see and seek more <laughs> Absolutely. And I think you uh, you said to me earlier that um, you get surprised sometimes how much the little kids know. Yes, yes, definitely. <laughs> because sometimes, um, especially in the dinosaur exhibition, which oh, I yeah. haven't expected before, because that's a very specific field um, where normally adults don't know so much about. <laughs> but then there are these um, all these children about, I would say, starting from four or five years old <laughs> and they know so much about the jurassic period they know so much about different theropods and sauropods and they just know so much about dinosaurs and their behavior and their biology it's just stunning to me how they get this information and 
even their parents are sometimes surprised when their children come and talk to me and teach me oh. actually about um, stuff they know. And uh, I'm always like, oh, okay, I, I should post I, more questions. <laughs> absolutely. I noticed uh, notice also in the London Natural History Museum, you will hear a child, they won't just say, you know, oh, that dinosaur is such and such. They'll, they'll actually come out with a correct binomial name as well. Yes, like, How yes, do they know right. that? You know, and they can pronounce it correctly. And it's not only about the T-Rex, it's, <laughs> it's about all the dinosaurs. Uh, yeah, <laughs> it's just stunning. Yeah. <laughs> now, you have an Instagram account, Leanne's Lab News. Uh, what do you hope that this account will accomplish and uh, who is it aimed at? Well, first of all, I just hope to spread science to everyone and bring it to everyone so that everybody, especially non-specialists, can understand and get to know new findings, get to know new inventions and everything what's happening in the world of science. Because I think it's just such a pity that um, many findings and inventions and everything what's, yeah, what science reveals often stays in an elite, elite group of scientists and mm. I think it's important to actually bring this to the public to the people and I just feel like social media is a great platform to reach everybody and reach people from all over the world and uh, it's also a light form like a casual form of um, giving information away so I just hope that I can yeah somehow bring my fascination to the people and uh, make them see that science isn't that boring and geeky at all and it's actually understandable to everyone when someone actually tries to <laughs> explain it and um, that's more or less why i'm doing it um that was my first goal and while doing it i just realized how much fun it is to um yeah. to research all the topics and to talk about them and to write about them and uh, yeah, I just love what I'm doing. And I also see it like as a practice for my future career because um, since I am going to be a science communicator, I think social media is getting more and more important today. And um, I also see it as a practice to, um, because on social media, you also get instant feedback from people. And then you know instantly what people understand the best, what they like the best, what they um, hope to see and um, hope to learn on such platforms. So I feel like it's um, it only has good sides for me to do that. Absolutely. I mean, that's how, how we got in contact. I think you you had commented on one of my posts on the Evolution Soup yes, Instagram. Right. <laughs> and I, and I, I saw, you know, what you were doing. And then I knew, you know, this is definitely going to be an interview. <laughs> and um, and we do sort of, we both think the same, especially when it comes to the Instagram, because uh, I'm trying to get evolution and science out there, but I'm doing it with like paleo art and mm -hmm. written rather than a whole bunch of uh, boring diagrams and that kind of thing. And it's, yeah, it, it's we, we, we yeah. both sort of like posting things about animals and so forth and that. Definitely, uh, yes. And yeah. I'm, I'm doing different things on Facebook and Instagram. So on Facebook, I I'm more or less only um, like only sharing scientific news because I think that's how Facebook works for most of the people. It's like a news feed, more or less. Um, just the um, series about the endangered animals is on Facebook too, which is a exception for that. But on Instagram, I do a bit more. I um, also share yeah. these news, but I also try to explain everyday signs um, like. For example, um, why you cry when you cut an onion or stuff like that. But also, yeah. of course, much about animals and evolution. Just because I'm, I'm really interested in it. And that's also why I have like most of the experience. Um, why do you cry when you cut an onion? Just, just um, very briefly. <laughs> You got me yeah, intrigued it's, now. It's because, um, <laughs> okay, I, I'll try to break it down. Um, so there are two substances in an onion. Um, and when you cut it, you cut through the cells and then these two substances get together and create a gas and this gas makes you cry because it's kind of a defense mechanism of the, the onion. So, for example, when you were, um, if you were an animal which is outside and 
a bit into an onion and you instantly start to cry, <laughs> then you see, okay, maybe next time I wouldn't take this one, I will choose the grass, <laughs> for example. Well, you keep quite busy writing on the subject of science as a freelance journalist, as well as broadcasting in studio for DW's science broadcast spectrum. So what are your favorite science stories? Yes, I work as a freelance journalist too, um, next to my studies. Um, so I'm writing for the science section of a local newspaper here in Bonn. And I also um, do radio shows at um, Bonn FM, which is our campus radio. And I did join some of um, DW Deutsche Welle's um, Spectrum podcast, which um, is the German foreign broadcaster for everyone who doesn't know it. Um, so I'm doing like kind of different stuff, <laughs> but so I have, I definitely have um, favorite stories. So I think for the newspapers, my favorite story was when I was interviewing an astronomer and um, he was literally working on a flying telescope. So there was this um, plane which they just rebuilt into a flying telescope. So he would travel around the, the world and look into the universe, which is just so fascinating to me. And they actually um, discovered a new molecule in the universe, a helium molecule. <laughs> okay. um, that was a very interesting interview. And I wrote a portrait about the scientist in the end, um, which was really nice. And I really enjoyed that work. And another one, which was um, very different, but also very interesting, was um, when I joined uh, DW Deutsche Welle's podcast um, mm. last year in September, um, when I was doing my internship there. Um, that was when I, <laughs> I saw that a Chinese, um, a Chinese company called Synergene, um, they are selling, yeah, they are actually selling clone pets and okay. um, on their homepage, um, they didn't say anything about their memory transfer project, but they said it at a press conference. So memory they, transfer. Yeah, they said <laughs> that they would go and transfer the memories from from the original animal into the clone one, which is just so freaky to me. Which is it's just I can't think how this is like ethically not okay and. I also mm. can think about how they will manage to do that. So I talked to a couple of scientists, a couple of neurobiologists, and um, they all confirmed that this is not true. But still, it was such a funny story that we talked about it and on the Spectrum podcast. And I also talked to a neuroscientist here in Bonn from the Neurological Institute CESA. I don't know if people know that. Um, it's from the Max Planck mm. Institute. Um, oh, yes. And uh, so I talked to him, and he told me that it's complete bullshit. <laughs> uh, but yeah, he told me, he tried to explain to me why it is bullshit and why it doesn't work. And um, yeah, so we just had a funny chat about this topic, and yeah. it was fabulous. <laughs> I mean, it sounds like a, a makings of a horror movie. I think I think yeah, we right? are sort of. Not close enough to be able to do memory transfer, not yet. Anyway. No, no. Well, there was like some kind of memory transfer when um, American scientists from the University of California, they um, succeeded in transferring a reflex from a marine snail to another marine snail. So it was something like when they poked their tail, they would like shrink it or something like that. Hmm. So they actually transplanted this reflex into another snail but of course you can discuss now is that memory transfer already or um already just, there. That just yeah <laughs> already there <laughs> <laughs> i'm sure you have a lot of young people who follow your work and also people not only of your ethnicity but various mm -hmm. ethnicities uh with evolution soup i aim to speak to people from all kinds of backgrounds so how important is it for you to bring a love of the sciences to uh young girls uh young people in general and people of color. Mm -hmm. So to me, it's very important to bring all of the, the information that I'm sharing on the Young's Lab News to everyone, um, no matter which ethnicity or which cultural background or which age or whatever background they have, because I think science just most of the time concerns everyone and everyone has the right to know about it. 
And um, that's actually why I chose to do that, because I just want to bring it to everyone and to encourage mm. everyone and also especially young people, girls and women and um, people of color, for example, because um, they are still minority groups in science. And I think it's very important that we especially encourage them to go into science, to um, try and find their way and do whatever they're interested in because people of different backgrounds also bring different perspectives and new ideas into science, which is mm. just how the whole field grows. Liang, before we sign off, if there's anyone watching from the backgrounds we just mentioned and perhaps has an interest in the sciences, but is not sure what to do with it, what would you say to them right now? Go for it. If you're interested in science, if you're interested in any field of science, no matter if it's evolution or or chemistry or physics or whatever, just go for it and um, try to contact people who um, are working in this field. Exchange your information that you have and um, learn more about it from other people. You can also go to events um, about these fields or um, try to read more about it, but just don't give up because you think that you won't fit into that or anything else. Mm -hmm. There just there isn't. I think there isn't a field where anyone can't fit in if they are really fascinated about it. So if you really want to do that and you really want to learn more about it, I can just encourage you to go and go and learn more about it. Go and involve yourself into it, and I am sure that. If you really want it and you really try to to get it, then everyone can make it and everyone can be a scientist. <laughs> all right, that's really great. I'm going to leave links to all your uh, social media in the description below. And all that is left to say is Liang Zhao, thank you very much indeed. Thanks for having me.